Welcome everyone to day 10 now of Advent of Code 2019 in Rust. Um, if you haven't been following along uh, in this series of videos, we've been solving all the 2019 Advent of Code problems in Rust and we are on day 10. Um, but just to remind everybody that if you want to follow along with the code, oops, uh, it is available at this repository here, BC Myers AOC 2019. Um, and so as we move along, we're going to commit here and you can check out the code. Um, as I did before, I sort of made a preliminary commit set up for day 10 to avoid doing some sort of tedious work that you don't want to see, but we added a benchmark for day 10, pulled in day 10's input, and created just like a little blank um, module for day 10 that we can work from and wire it all up. And so with that, we should be ready to dig into day 10. But before I did that, um, I wanted to mention something else that we've talked about before, but there's been a blog post on it, and so I wanted to update you. So um, if you guys remember, there's many, many times in which we have iterated over the lines of a file. Um, to parse each line individually. And it's been pointed out to me a couple times um, that I do it in this very verbose fashion using loops. Um, so I'll often have, uh, get some sort of buff reader, right? And then allocate a buffer, a string buffer uh, here. And then in a loop, sort of use that reader to call read line, which can fail. Um, and also return zero if you ever reach the end of the um, into the, the file or buffer you're trying to read over, so that's why you break here. Um, and then you do, you, then you have access to the line and you do stuff with it and you clear the buffer at the end of each iteration of the loop. So this is sort of my preferred way to read in lines um, and it's kind of verbose. It's kind of verbose because Rust offers like this nice lines iterator on a buff reader, um, which is, I mean, a little bit easier, right? You call lines on a reader, a buff read, something that implements buff read, and you get back um, this lines iterator, which is an iterator of IO results of strings. So to get the line out, you just unwrap that, uh, or get the okay case of that result, and now you have a line and you do stuff with it. And so this is much more terse and clean. And you can also, here, you can use functional style in Rust, because you could put on some combinators on the end of this instead of doing it in a for loop like I've done here. Um, but, uh, I've explained before why I prefer this version. This version only allocates a string once and reuses that buffer. Whereas this will create a new string for every line. Um, and so uh, this is all stuff we covered before, but I wanted to mention it because um, Nicholas Matsakis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is like one of Rust's sort of, I mean, he's one of the main people behind Rust, like, He's, he's, he, I mean, he is, I, I don't want to, there's a whole bunch of people who contribute to Rust, but he's one of the main guys. And he's been going around interviewing people, trying to figure out what Rust needs next for async await, um, and posting about it. And so here's one of his latest blog posts. He did an um, interview with Kramer TJ, which is the guy who um, sort of uh, maintains the futures library in Rust and also works on the compiler and does a bunch of stuff. Um, this whole interview, by the way, is, is on YouTube as well. If you search for um, you know, async interview, Ross, Nicholas Matsakis, you'll find it. Um, but Nicholas also sort of writes up what he says after about it. And so this is like a topical thing in Rust. And one of the main things that we're talking about is Rust has a futures type um, that is now in the standard library that is a lot like a JavaScript promise and it is part of the whole async await ecosystem. Um, and there's also a trait, um, like a stream trait, but this is not yet in the standard library. Um, so a future, let me see if I can get this right. A future represents like a series of computations essentially that will happen and turn into a value um, but it's not a value yet and a stream is sort of a similar idea except for it's a bunch of comp uh, it's a bunch of uh, computations that will happen but have not happened yet that end up producing values in a stream so multiple values after another it's kind of the 
the async await version of iterators is what a stream is. But stream is not in the standard library yet. Um, it's still in the third party futures crate. Um, and the reason is, is because there's sort of something they would like to express uh, on streams that Rust is not capable of yet. And it ties into sort of, it ties into this business with our lines iterator. So that's why I want to talk about it and show you that it's kind of a topical conversation in Rust. Um, so uh, read through this blog post if you want to. I won't go in here, but um, I won't go into detail here. But when they talk about the need for streaming streams or streaming iterators, uh, the topic is exactly what we're going to discuss now. So, um, so this lines iterator that creates a new string every single time uh, it produces a new line. What, it, what does this iterator actually look like in Rust? Well, I pulled this more or less from the standard library. So here's what the lines liter, uh, iterator looks like. It uh, takes the reader, it takes ownership of the buff reader, um, well, the type that implements IO buff read, and then it implements iterator, and every time you call next, right, it's gonna create a new string, it's going to uh, read a line into that string, and then um, return none if read line gave you a zero, just like we do up here. Um, but if it doesn't, right, it's going to pop off the, um, the new line characters, et cetera, et cetera, and return you that string. So um, now you see why in the standard library, like a new, new string is created each time this iterates and it's returned to you. What you'd like to do, here's what you'd like to write um, in order to make this code sort of completely equivalent to this code, um, but use an iterator. What you'd like to write is you'd like to sort of store one internal buffer that um, you will, the iterator will give you references to. Um, so you store that internally within the lines um, structure. You still have the reader here. And then the type that you return, you want to return from this, this newfangled lines iterator, right, is an IO result not of a string, but of a reference to a string where the lifetime of that string has the lifetime of the iterator itself. So this is not fully baked syntax, but I think this is like what they're contemplating adding to be able to do this. I'm not quite sure, but you sort of get the idea. However, the syntax ends up being, um, ends up whatever Rust decides on for the syntax, you get the idea that the item we want to return from the, the this iterator is a reference to a string and the lifetime is pointing to this buffer here. So then when you call next, right, um, you got to be generic over your lifetime because you're going to return a string that points into yourself, right? And then you just do the same thing, except for at the end, you return sort of a reference to self buff. And this is sort of not yet possible in Rust. What this requires is something called generic associated types. And the name, if you've heard that and it's scary, it should now make a lot of sense. Like this is an associated type and it needs to be generic over the lifetime parameter of the um, reference that you're returning, right? So once Rust can do generic associated types, which is being thought about and worked on, there's an RFC on it, then this kind of code will be possible. And we can use an iterator to do this as opposed to do it the sort of long and loopy verbose way that I have been. But in the meantime, I prefer this way. Um, and this is also something, so this, is, this would be a quote unquote streaming iterator. So if you read this blog post and you want to talk uh, hear about streaming streams and streaming iterators, um, hopefully this will give you a little bit more context into understanding what they're talking about and understanding where Rust is going and understanding some of the things that um, unlocking generic associated types in Rust, which is not yet in stable, would get you. Um, but as I mentioned, there's an RFC, Request for Comments, I think is what that stands for. Um, on generic associated types um, that's been around since 2016 and I think there's now sort of new effort in this area because folks want the async await story to be good and they want streams to be good and so we want to have some sort of stream type that maybe sort of takes advantage of these GATs and so you can read about all the RFC here and the discussion on you know Rust's RFC uh, repository um, but I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, I know it doesn't have anything to do with day 10, but um, 
But I saw this blog post and I thought, hey, that is exactly what we've been talking about and I can go into a little bit more detail. And now you guys should no longer be afraid of, if you were before, this generic associated type um, idea because that's, this, is, this is the kind of thing that it unlocks. And so it'll be helpful for not just futures and async await, but for you know, just regular iterators as well. So with that, let's dive into day 10. So that was part one, and the rest of the video is gonna be just day 10. And I think it might actually be a little bit long. Sorry about this, guys, but I have a lot I wanna talk about today. So what is day 10? Well, first of all, I always like to look at the input. So our input looks like this. And basically what this is, is it's a two-dimensional map in sort of Cartesian coordinates, right? Of asteroids, which are hash lines, and empty space, which is the period. So this is like just a whole bunch of asteroids in space. Um, and the only other thing we need to know is this is sort of the coordinate system here is how, is the coordinate system that I guess game programmers usually use. Um, but will be unfamiliar to folks like uh, folks who are used to sort of regular math x y coordinates. Uh, I'm one of those folks, by the way. I don't like reasoning in this game coordinates. But basically, all that means is um, the origin is here. This is zero zero, and you get bigger. So this is the same as regular math. You get when you get bigger in this direction, uh, x goes up, right? So this is like. This is x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3. But uh, what's sort of backwards is the y um, axis because you get bigger as you go down here. So this is like y equals 0, this is y equals 1, this is y equals 2, y equals 3, etc., etc. As opposed to if you used to math, the origin would be down here and positive x would be this direction and positive y would be this direction. Well, now I'm just repeating what I just said, but now our origin is up here. This is still positive x, but positive y is down. All right, so with that little um, extra detail included, what is the actual problem? So the actual problem is um, you are gonna be able to shoot, well, you wanna know these asteroids can see other asteroids. So let's take this asteroid here. This asteroid can see uh, this asteroid here um, it can see this asteroid here, this asteroid here, this asteroid down here, because it's got a direct line to it. But it can't see this asteroid here because it's blocked, right? So here's the one we're looking at. If you go up, its view is blocked by this asteroid, so it, can no, it cannot see this asteroid. And basically what we're asked to do is to loop over all of these asteroids and figure out which one can see the most other asteroids. That's part one. Uh, so we need to count for each asteroid, like which, how many other asteroids they can see, and then figure out which one can see the most. Once we do that, we are going to, I guess, like establish a base or something on that asteroid. So say, say we ended up finding this one was the right one, which is not. I think it's the right one is like down here somewhere. But anyway, let's say it was. Let's say it was this one. So now we establish a base on this asteroid and we create a laser. <laughs> Very exciting. And the laser is gonna start uh, shooting up, well up in, in our sense, but actually in the negative y direction. It's gonna start shooting in the negative y direction. Um, and then the laser is gonna rotate around 360 degrees in a clockwise fashion. And every time it hits an asteroid, so if, if we started in the up direction, it would hit this asteroid and destroy it, right? And then it would rotate a little bit and it would probably hit this asteroid and destroy it. And then it would rotate a bit and it would keep rotating and it gets to destroy asteroids as it comes into contact with them. But this asteroid will not get destroyed, right, until the second go round because uh, the first go round it hits this one and then it moves on. So it won't get back to sort of straight up and down vertical until it goes around one more time and then it hits this one. So we're gonna destroy the asteroid field like this. And apparently the elves are like kind of a betting, betting guys, betting people, betting guys and gals, and uh, they are betting on which asteroid is gonna be the 200th one that gets destroyed. Um, and so that is the question to the second problem is what is the 200th asteroid that is destroyed? 
So hopefully that is uh, clear and you guys kind of understand the problem. So let's dive in and start coding it. So let's go over, I already brought in the data and everything. Here it is. Uh, let's go over and to our day 10 module, which I have pre-created and start um, coding. So the first thing we're gonna need to do is I wanna create a vector of all of the asteroids. So we're gonna need a parse input function, uh, which is going to take in a mutable reader and output a result of a vector of asteroids, which are gonna be points, or an error, if we can't parse. And this generic R parameter needs to implement IO buff read. Unimplemented. So we're gonna parse our input. Um, so let's just add it up here. So we're gonna get back um, some points. Once we parse our input and give it the reader, and this can fail. Um, okay, so we have some points. And then we're gonna use those points to answer part one. But first let's get the points. Um, well, we don't have a point type. But we used point before, so let's let's make let's put points in our uh, let's put the point type in our utilities folder because maybe we'll use it again. So struct point uh, is just a tuple of i 64s let's say, and let's make it pub crate, and let's let you access those uh, values by just little getter methods. So this returns star self dot zero and y you can get the y coordinate with um, star well this doesn't need to be star why is that star uh, self dot one and these also need to be pub crate Um, and I guess these need to be pub create too, unless we want to create a constructor. Let's create a constructor. Pub create function new. Uh, X is an I64, Y is an I64. And this gives us a point. And we just do self X, Y. There we go. So now we have a nice little point that we can use in day 10. So let's pull it in. Use create utils point. Um, all right. So how are we going to read in these points? Well, we are going to, I guess, um, I don't need this, but for you guys, let's pull up the actual data so you can see. We're going to read lines. Um, and so we're going to do it in the um, verbose but efficient way because why not? So let mute buff equals string new uh, loop uh, reader dot read line into the buffer, which can fail. And we want to check whether or not this is equal to zero. If it is, we break. So this is if. And after every line, we clear our buffer. Oops. And in here, we have access to the line. Uh, okay, so each line. Well, I guess we're gonna we're gonna accumulate a vector of points. So let mute vec equals or let mute points equals vec new, right? Um, and each line represents a row. So let's start a running count of the y coordinate, right? And after every time we iterate through a line, we're gonna go on to the next y coordinate. Um, good. So in this line, we now we're in a line, right? So we want to iterate over the characters here. Let's take our buff, trim it, and call cars, which gives us an iterator over the characters. And we will call enumerate so we can get the index. And then we will filter map so 
in the side this filter map we'll have the index and we'll have the x value right because um, this is x equals 0 x equals 1 x equals 2 um, well we'll have the character the character I guess this is a character this is the x value um, all right so filter map you return an option of the kind of type that you want to turn the iterator into, but this this is this is like combining filter and map. So if you want to throw something away, you return none. If you want to keep it, you return some of the thing you want to keep. And so what we want to do is we want to say if c equals um, hashtag, right? Then we want to keep you. So we will return some point, and its x coordinate is x, and its y coordinate is y. And otherwise, let's do it like this. Otherwise, we return none. Uh, actually, we don't want to filter map. Let's not filter map. What we want to do is for each. Because all we want to do is if we get one of these, we want to create a point, right? Uh, point x comma y and then we just want to add it to our points vector that we're keeping so push point and otherwise we do nothing oh and we can't create a point like that we gotta create a point like this and these need to be i64's so let's say as i64 as i64 So there we go. We should, at the end of this, if we just return OK points, have all our points. So let's check that by printing them out to the console and looking at them. So print line points, which needs to be debug. Uh, points does not implement debug. Points should implement all the things. So let's go back to points and say, derive, copy, clone, debug, eek, partial eek. Uh, no, no ord really, right? But hash, sure. There we go, okay. So let's go back to 10 and now we should be good. So let's go back to bash and say cargo run day 10 with data uh, 10 see what we get. Oh, let's uh, let's do it like this so we can see it better. Four points and points. Print line point. And let's see. Just to make double sure, let's bring up our data, which is uh, here. So we have an asteroid at zero, zero. We have one at one, zero, right? We skip two, zero. Then we have three, zero and four, zero. And then we skip five and we skip six and we have seven, zero. So that looks good. Let's see if we're getting the next row right. So it, the next row, so down here, right? We have x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals 3, 4, 5, then we skip a couple. So this looks good. We've re read our data in, right? All right. Um, so that's parse input. So now let's do, let's do, this is parse input. Let's do part 1. All right. So for part 1, Let's also create a function. We're going to need the points as a slice of points. And we're going to return the answer, which is a u size. Let's return 42 for now. Um, and up here we'll say let answer 1 equals part 1. Um, pass in a reference to the points. 
And so now we can print it. Answer one. Points. Mm. Okay. So uh, maybe there's a faster way to do this, but the way I did this was I said, look, we're going to essentially figure out the direction. We're going to iterate over all the points. So first we're going to look at point this, this asteroid. Oops. First we're going to look at the first asteroid. And while we're on this first asteroid, we are then going to, in addition, using this as the origin point, look at all of the other asteroids. So unfortunately, this is going to be n squared because we're going to we're going to do this essentially for origin origin in uh, points. This is points, and for other in points. So you guys get where we're going to look at all the points. Um, um, and so now we're going to, for, for, the, for this origin point, we're going to figure out what is the angle, essentially, uh, what is the angle to, to this other point. So what we want to do is we want uh, let uh, sort of angle equals uh, like compute angle between origin and other. Right, so we're gonna get out the angle between the origin that we're looking at now and all of its other points. And we wanna keep track of that, because if you, uh, I'm explaining this badly. So the number of things that this one will be able to see, if we just iterate through all the points um, and we count them, right, uh, we're good, except for we don't, if we find two asteroids that it sees that both have the same sort of angle, then we only want to count that once. Um, and so what we can do is we can create a we can create a hash map up here. Uh, hash map, which means we're going to need hash map. So use standard collections hash map. Well, and we're going to need in a second hash set as well. So what this hash map is going to keep track of is I'm going to say for every point I want to know the uh, angles that um, the angles that it can see. So let's keep a hash set of angles, let's call it, I guess, or the angle or direction, the directions that it can see something at, right? Um, so we're going to commute, this is going to, I guess, compute direction, right? And we're going to get a direction back. So in what direction is this point relative to the point we're treating as the origin now? And so then we'll just say map.entry, we'll give it the origin and we will insert uh, or insert with a new hash set. So we know we have a value in there. And if we do, then we will just insert this new direction. And we know that um, we'll just get, we'll, we'll count up all the directions that each point can see, right? But if there are multiple asteroids in one direction, we'll only count it once. And somebody's at my door, so hold on a second. Hello? Oh, okay, come in. Sorry about that, guys. It was Amazon um, delivering packages. Uh, and so at the end here, right, once we have this map, uh, to find the to find the sort of origin point that can see the most astro other asteroids, all we have to do is say um, 
Let's see, map dot iter dot uh, map, and this will give us the point and the uh, set, right? And we want to turn that into a tuple of points. Well, I guess we want to fold here. Let's fold. So we want to fold. And we want to start out with um, our state initially is going to be uh, finding zero other asteroids. And we have no sort of point that fits our criteria. Um, and this is now going to be state and point and set. And here we can say, OK, uh, let's get the count, which is set.lin. So this is uh, for this particular point, this is the, as the number of directions it can see, right? And if. Uh, the count is greater than our state dot zero, which is where we're keeping track of the maximum number. Then we want to say our state. We have found the maximum. We have found it, so far at least. We found the best sort of point, the one with the most directions that it can see. And so let's save that into our state as count, uh, which is the count, and some uh, point, which is the point. And we'll just return our state. And so at the end of all of this mess, right, we should have uh, we should have our answer. Well, let's call it max. And we should also know the point which we're going to need for the second problem. So this is why I'm doing this. We also know the point at which uh, that has that maximum. Um, but the point is an option. So we say let point equals point dot OK or else. Um, this is bad if we could not have found a point, so we'll write an error message in a second. But that means this needs to return a result. And actually, let's keep track of the point that we found as well. Not only how many things it can see, but what point it was. Because again, we're going to need that for part two. So, and an error. And so now we can just return down here, OK of max and point. Um, let's see what type point is because I think it might be a reference, but we need it to be, well, I know it's going to be a reference. So this is going to be a reference to a point. Well, it's an option right now. It's right now. This is an option of a reference of a point. We sort of unwrap that option, if you will, but now we have a reference. And so let's dereference it. And I think that will return us like a real point, not a reference to a point. Um, so now all we need to do to make this um, sort of work is, well, this is answer one. And this is the asteroid that can see the most, which remember is where we're going to put our laser. So we found the answer to number one and we found the laser. Um, and this can now fail. Um, and now we just don't have these things. So we actually don't need a compute direction. Let's, let's, let's create this direction type where we can create a direction from an origin point and another point. And so that way, all we need to do now is have a direction type. And this should stop yelling at us. So for this direction type, we'll need to be uh, eek and hash, if it's not all, uh, because we're putting it in hash maps, I think, or in the hash set. So, oops, partial eek. Let's see what else it's yelling at us about. Uh, oh, it doesn't have a new function, so let's create that. Impl direction uh, function new um, origin is a point, and well, origin is a point, and other is a point, and this returns self. And you, for the moment, are unimplemented. All right. So I think 
These are references to points, but points are copy, so let's dereference them. Now that works, and this also needs to be an actual point, not a reference to a point. Um, and down here, obviously, state needs to be mutable because we're mutating it, so let's make it mutable. And there we go. I think uh, I think we have the right answer. So um, now all we have to do is figure out what if we have two points, what is the sort of angle between them or the direction? Um, and you can do this, I guess I'll do this the, um, the slow way first, just because it's easy. Um, so the first thing we want to do is, what's the relative x and y of, of, of these points? So if we take other dot x and subtract origin dot x, and then we take other dot y and subtract origin dot y. This is the sort of relative. I mean, this is if we if we translated the coordinate system such that the origin point was actually at zero zero, right? Then the coordinates of the other point would be this. I hope you guys can see that. Um, so. To get an angle between, uh, uh, now I should talk about trigonometry. We're not actually going to use a different thing, but you guys know, you guys remember a little bit of trigonometry, right? Hopefully. Um, so you can take any point in, sp in 2D space, right? And if you have just regular Cartesian coordinates, X and Ys, that's sort of like one way to encode your position in, um, in 2D space. But another way to encode your position in 2D space Right is to give not an x and a y coordinate, but a radius and an angle. Um, and so here, this this point in and that's called being in polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, this point right here has a radius of three, and it's an angle 60 degrees from the sort of positive x-axis, right? And this point down here is longer, so it's got a radius of four, and it's 210 degrees from uh, the the positive x-axis. Um, and so this is sort of like a way to encode where you are in space. And uh, the key thing, the thing we're interested in, for the moment we don't care about how long these things are, how far away you are. All we want to know is are, what's, the, what's the angle or the direction. Um, and so we need to figure out how to calculate this sort of angle. Um, but that's easy with a little bit of trigonometry. You guys remember your trigonometry, hopefully. Um, so let's say you've got an angle here that you want to find, right? And we know uh, x and y will give us b, right? So b is, it's like, as it, if this were the origin, then b is um, like where our point is in space, right? It's at like some x value and some y value. And so we know that this right here is just, that's our x coordinate, and this is our y coordinate, right? Um, and so to get this angle, this the tangent of this angle, whatever it is, is gonna be the opposite over the adjacent because that's what tangent is, right? Um, so if we take the opposite, we take the y value, we divide by the, uh, divide by the x value, um, that is the tangent of the angle. Um, but we don't want, we're not given the angle, or sorry, yeah, we're given, we need a function that goes from this ratio of a over b, opposite over adjacent, and gives us the angle. And the way you do that is with the, um, you don't use the tangent function, you use the inverse tangent function, which is down here somewhere. Uh, use arctangent, where's arctangent? Well, it's not on this page, but use the, there's a function called arctangent, which if you give it the ratio of the um, sort of rise over the run, right, it will tell you the angle. Except for arctangent is not perfect. Um, for reasons that are, I guess we can explain here, right? So if we just had, uh, well, let's see what we're gonna do. So we know the ratio matters, right? So let's say ratio equals uh, opposite 
as f64 divided by adjacent as f64. So that's the ratio of the rise of the run. And what we want is sort of arc tangents of that ratio. Um, but we don't actually want that because the arc tangent cannot tell the difference between being in the first coordinate, in the first quadrant, and the third quadrant, and it can't tell the difference between being in the fourth quadrant and the second quadrant <laughs> if we do it like this, right? Um, because what? Oh, you guys should know. I, I meant to talk about this too because I don't know how much trigonometry or math you guys know. Um, so let's go. Let's look at this real quick. Um, trig. All right, so here's like our coordinate system and our x and y axis, and here's the origin, right? And when I, when I talk about quadrants, I mean the first quadrant is the one where x values are positive and y values are positive, so we're up here. Um, the second coordinate is the one where uh, x values are negative and y values are positive, so we're over here. The third coordinate is negative x, negative y, and the fourth quadrant is positive x, positive y. Um, so, uh, arc tangent, if we just give it the ratio of the um, y divided by x, hopefully it's clear that it cannot tell whether or not you are in quadrant one or quadrant three. Because if you're in quadrant one, you're gonna have a positive value divided by a positive value, which is positive. If you're in quadrant three, you're gonna have a negative value divided by a negative value, which is positive. And so we're essentially, the arc tangent function will see being in these two quadrants is like the same thing. But you want to be able to differentiate that. And likewise, it will see being in two and four is the same because here the ratio will be negative and here the ratio will be negative. And so you never sort of use, I mean, you rarely use arctangent when you have this, when you have this problem where you're in 2D space and you can be anywhere in positive or negative coordinates, right? Um, so you use a tan two, which is a different function. And if you want to, I mean, Look, I, I sort of learned about this a while, but I was trying to think of a way to explain this, and I can't explain it as well as this guy does. Um, so if you want to find a video on everything I'm talking about because it's not clear, um, go find uh, TV with Nerd First um, 0612 and watch this sort of short video. Oops, I don't want to pull it up. I don't even know if I can do that on YouTube. Um, and watch him explain what why we have an ATAN2 function. But the ATAN2 function, right, uh, instead of taking the ratio in and giving you the angle, it uh, you give it explicitly the y value itself and the x value itself, and so that way it has enough information to know whether or not you're in this quad in it's, it can differentiate between being in the first quadrant and the third quadrant. It can differentiate between being in the second and the fourth, and so this is kind of a neat little thing that shows what we're talking about, right? So like, if we just used a tan like the arc tangent function, we'd get sort of this graph right here, right? Like, so you put it, you, you throw in a ratio, right? So say the ratio was one, and that says the angle from the x-axis is, is this, right? Is whatever this value is. But um, uh, a tan two is, well, um, like this crazy function that adds this and adds this, and all it does is like this allows you to sort of differentiate right between whether or not you're which quadrant you're in. So this would be this stuff over here would be let's see we have a positive ratio and we get out a positive oh and x is positive so this means we're in the first quadrant right here so all this stuff is for first quadrant um, over here we've got a negative x so we're on the left-hand side of the plane, but our total ratio is negative, which means we must have a negative y. Um, so this is the third quadrant, is that? No, sorry, our entire ratio is, ne is negative, so our y has gotta be positive, right? Um, so this means we're in the second quadrant. Um, down here is uh, negative x and negative ratio. So that means we're, um, no, this is positive x and negative ratio, right? Which means that we're in the fourth quadrant. And over here, 
just to be complete and show you guys that it takes me a while to reason about math, uh, but I can do it. Um, so here we are, we have a negative x value, but our overall ratio is positive, um, meaning we have to also have a negative y value. So this is the third quadrant down here, negative x, negative y. Um, so that's kind of how arctangent is like defined. And so let's use it because it's in the rough standard library. Uh, I don't have I don't have the Rust standard library up. Rust vec. ATAN2. So on F64s, we have an ATAN2 function, which computes the four quadrant arc tangent of self and other in radians. Perfect. <laughs> Let's use it. Oh, and then I should also mention radians, right? So what we mean by radians is the, these angles around these quadrants are in radians. So if you have no angle, meaning you're straight on the x-axis, you have that zero radians or two pi radians or four pi radians or six pi radians, because when you go around the circle, it's two pi. So if you rotate all the way around to here, you're at pi over two radians. If you rotate all around over here, you're at pi radians. If you rotate around again, you're at three pi over two and rotate around again, you're at zero or at two pi. You can also go backwards. So if you go, if you start from here and you go this way, you get negative pi over two. So these two are equivalent, right? And notice they're separated by two pi, which they should be. Um, and then you go over here and you get negative, you get to negative pi, and these two are equivalent and separated by two pi, as they should be. Um, all right. So that is, if you guys didn't know the basics of trigonometry, that is my quick and dirty way to explain it. So a tan two takes, you, you take the y value as f64 and you call a tan two on it and you give it the x value of x as f64. And this is now sort of like the angle, right? Um, and so we can just store that as an f64 in direction and say our direction that we return here is just that. So this will uniquely identify what direction we're looking in, which is what we want. But now we run into an interesting problem that, um, that, uh, that I need to talk about because floats in Rust do not implement eek and do not implement hash. And so that's a problem if you ever want to put them in a hash map or a hash set, which we do. And um, you can work around this, right? Because the reason why they don't implement eek and they don't implement hash is because of NAN, uh, which is what happens if you ever try to like take a float and divide by zero or anytime you can imagine sort of getting infinity or blowing up or going to a limit, right? Like you're gonna get something undefined and, and the way that's sort of encoded in a float is is with this NAND business. And NANDs are such that um, if you have a NAND float, it does not equal another NAND float. Um, and so this breaks sort of hash, right? Because the invariants of hash are the following. If x equals y, then the hash of x has to equal the hash of y, right? And so you can have, uh, I'm explaining this poorly, but NANDs sort of break this invariant, and so they're bad. And that's why you can't hash a float in Rust. But we can make a wrapper type that actually does hash. So let's do that. And this is kind of handy if you ever run this problem, if you want to put floats in a hash map in Rust. So let's create a new type called F64 that just wraps an F64. And this is going to be able to be copy and clone and debug. Um, and then we'll tell it all the other things it's gonna be. So first of all, let's implement dref so that it's easy. This is like a wrapper type, so it's easy to get access to the inner type. So the target on this is going to be um, just an F64 and DREF 
is going to give us a reference to that and all that is is self.0, right? Use standard ops deref. And we, we could go implement all the things like deref mute and stuff like that. If you're going to use this over as a type in like other libraries, you would make that more robust. But let's just say deref for now. And then we want to implement all of the equality and ordering and hashing manually. So implement partial eek for f64. And partial eek. So let's look up all of these methods, all of these traits. So we need to implement eek for partial eek. So there we go. Um, so what we're going to do, well, first of all, we're going to say in the constructor of, this is how we get around our problem. We're going to create a constructor for, <coughs> excuse me, F64. Actually, no, uh, we're not going to create a constructor. We can do this with uh, impl try from F64 for F64 type error equals error use standard convert try from uh, function try from so if we have it if we have a regular float it can maybe turn into our float um, and what we're gonna do in order to make it hashable is we're going to say, hey, if you are not a number, right, well, then no, you cannot be this type. So cannot convert into F64, F, sure. Otherwise, uh, you, sir, can be an F64. Um, and that is how we're just going to eliminate NANs altogether by disallowing them. So here we need use create error error. So now that we know we cannot be looking at a float with a NAN at all, um, then all we do here is we say uh, self dot zero dot eek uh, other dot zero and we and that's it actually this could be derived this can be derived because floats actually do implement partial eek um, so we don't need to do that what we do need to do, floats do not implement eek, so we need to tell it it implements eek. Which is going to be okay because we don't have nans. Um, and eek has no methods. Uh, so it's just, you just say, I implement eek. So the other thing we want to implement is, well, we don't even really need partial ord or ord because we're not sort of sorting these. All we really need is for this to be hashable, which is, in order to implement hash, you need to implement this. So use standard hash hash. F64. What does hash look like? Uh, looks like this. So we got to implement this method, the hash method. Um, so this tells us if we have an F64, like how do we hash it? Um, this is standard hash hasher and the way this works is you're given a hasher and you just say um, well you're given this state that implement that is a mutual reference to something that implements a hasher um, you just say self.0. Dot oh uh, so we need something that can be hashed uh, so one thing that we could use that can be hashed is let's turn the um, float that we have into bits. Let's get its like raw bit uh, representation. 
which is going to be a U size, I think. Let's see what type it is. Uh, it's a U64. So we get the raw bits of this float 64. And now that we have these raw bits, we can hash those. So you just call hash and you give it state and we're done. So now we have a way to hash F64s and this won't be a problem because we've eliminated NANs. We're not, we're not dealing with NANs. We can't create this with NANs. And so now we have this sort of awesome wrapper F64 type and so directions, instead of holding a regular F64, can hold a RF64, and now they should be able to implement eek and hash. But we need to pull that in. So we need both a point and F64 from utils. And angle needs to be, well, this now needs to return a result, because if we have a NAND, that's a problem. Right, and this is going to be. Um, by the way, we know we're not going to get an AND because a, the ATAN two function. Where did it go? It, it's um, range, right? The range of this function is from negative pi to pi, and so it's never going to give you uh, any problematic floats. Um, so uh, angle. Uh, F64 try from angle and this can fail and now we're returning a result so this has to be okay and there we go and no try from because we got to import the trait And so here, when we create a direction, this can fail. But otherwise, we're good. And we might be good enough, this might be good enough for the first problem. Um, as an aside, there's a faster way to do this, avoiding using trigonometric functions. Because these, this is kind of expensive, right? Um, so maybe later we will avoid having to use this, but I just wanted to show you guys like the basic easiest way to do this, which is to use ATAN2, which gives you an angle. And so since we just want to find like for each point, how many like unique angles are there um, to answer number one, this is good, right? Um, so if we run this, are we just going to get the right answer? Did I, have I built out everything yet? Two sixty, we are. So this gives us the right answer for part one. We found uh, we found both the point or the asteroid that can see the most number of asteroids, and we also know how many asteroids that asteroid can see. Great. So let's move on to part two. In part two, right? Uh, let's recap with going. Let's look at the data again. So neovim dot data uh, 10. So we found the right point. Well, let's print it out so we can actually see which point it is. Print line uh, laser. This is where we're going to put the laser. So let's run again. Where are we going to put the laser? We're going to put the laser at 1417. So Oops, no, I want the data. So our laser is 14 over and 17 down, so it's down here somewhere. Uh, let's actually find it. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So this is our laser, I believe. Um, so now the problem is, starting looking up, right, so we're going to look up in, well, down in Y coordinates, but up for us. So we're going to look up, right, um, and we're going to like blow up, this is going to be the first asteroid we blow up, so kaboom, right. 
and then probably then we're going to rotate a little bit and find the next asteroid which I don't know might be this one so kaboom and we're going to rotate around 360 degrees in a clockwise fashion like blowing up asteroids which is fun and we want to know what is the 200th asteroid that we destroyed so um, in order to do this let's create part two function part two so we're going to need to know where our laser is and we're going to need to know where all the other points are right um, and we are going to return the probably a result and it's going to Let's answer the question more generally. Let's return an iterator that sort of iterates in order over all of these points. Um, so you can not only get the 200th one, you could get the 300th one or the 400th one or the second or whatever. Um, so let's create, let's, let's create a, an iterator called asteroids, which is what we want to get out of this function, which is going a bit above and beyond, but we'll do it. Which means we're gonna need an asteroids type which we don't know what it does yet, but we know it's going to implement iterator. Um, and what is it going to give us back? It's going to give us back uh, a point for now. And so function next at mute itself uh, option self uh, item and unimplemented. Uh, sorry, this is a slice of points, of points. Uh, this does not need, why does this need public? This does not need to be public. And as you guys look at this code, uh, I'm going to take a short break, which I guess will be instantaneous for you, but I'm gonna pause the video for a second. Um, ooh, I wonder if I can figure out a way to... There we go, so hopefully pausing and unpausing worked. I've never tried to do that before, but I am back, uh, which is instantaneous for you. Um, all right, so where are we? Right, we're in part two, and we want to return an iterator from our part two function that will iterate all over, over all the points in the order that, all the asteroids in the order that the laser is gonna hit them. So let's try and implement part two. So what we need to do, right, is say for point in points, uh, and if point equals laser, then continue, right? We don't want to obliterate ourselves. Um, we also wouldn't be able to calculate an angle between ourselves because I don't know what a tan 2 would do if you gave it 0, 0 as inputs. That'd be interesting to find out, but let's not find out. Uh, these are points, and we're going to have reference issues. There we go. However, now we're looking at every single point except for the laser point. Um, and what we want to know is, well, we want to create we want to create a vector of these. So let vec equals vec new. Let mute vec equals vec new. And really, at the moment, all I want to do is push these vec these points into the vec. But since you guys like functional rest so much, let's do this in a little better way. Points dot uh, into well iter dot filter uh, point point does not equal laser dot collect dot map probably point star point dot collect 
into a vector. And this needs to be that probably, and this needs to be that probably. Um, nope, it doesn't. There we go. Okay, so this is the code. This is the functional code to do this. So let's use the functional code because why not? Um, now, what I want to do is I actually don't want a vec. I do want a vec. So we are going to, this asteroid iterator is going to have to hold the vec, um, which is a vector of points. Um, so let's create an asteroids. Well, we're just going to return it, so asteroids vec. And I guess this does not error, so we don't need to... Return a result here. There we go. So that's part two, and it will just be um, all the all the logic for part two will do in this asteroids iterator. Um, But I'm not going to want, for reasons that will be obvious here, I'm not going to want a vec. Uh, well, I am going to want a vec. Okay, yeah, I know what I need to do. So we're not going to want to hold a vec. We're going to want to hold something else. So let's take in a vec, which is a vec of points, and we'll return self. But what we really want is a vec deck. So we want to return a self vec deck from vec. Um, but first we want to sort the vector, which we will leave to later. So this will need to be mutable. Use standard collections vec deck. And this now needs to be a vec deck. And this now needs to be asteroids new. All right. So now we have a vec deck of points in our asteroids which will be, once we implement it, uh, sorted in by the, um, well, in the right way. We're gonna have to sort by both angle and distance now, right? Because we want the first thing to be the first angle. So we wanna find all of the, like, all the asteroids uh, that are directly above L, right? But we wanna take the one that is the closest. And so we're gonna need to know the distance now too. Uh, but anyway, assume we can sort all this stuff in the right way. So then the iterator, all it needs to do is to say, um, well, oh, how did I do this before? Sort by the distance. I think I did something like this. Um, self dot zero dot pop front, and if we don't have one, we've run out, so we should. We're out. We're, we're done with the loop. So self dot zero dot pop front is the uh, asteroid, and the asteroid says. The asteroid is going to have, we need an asteroid type. Let's create that. Struct asteroid. The asteroid is going to know its point, where it's at. It's going to know its direction, which is uh, an 
F64. Uh, I guess it's angle. And it's going to know its distance, which is a U64. Um, so this is going to be a vector of, this is going to hold a vector of asteroids, a vectec of asteroids. Let's just make this uh, to do turn point into asteroid. And then we return it. And for the moment, we'll just say unimplemented. Great. Uh, so we get an asteroid. Um, and we want to keep track of the previous angle, which starts out as none. Uh, I guess this needs to be state inside the struct. Um, so this will start out with a previous, this will have a previous angle in it, which is an option of an F64. And this will be our um, Q, back deck ast asteroid. Okay. So we will have access to, we'll say, okay, if the asteroid's angle is equal to the uh, an angle that we just saw, so self dot previous angle. So this needs to be if let sum if let sum previous angle equals self dot self self dot previous angle. So if we have a previous angle and the asteroid's angle equals that previous angle. Well, just put it back on the queue at the back. So self dot zero dot push back um, asteroid. Um, and put it on the back and continue. So put it to the back of the line because we, we just saw one, like we just saw one that had the same angle. And so we don't want to touch this one until we come all the way back around, right? Um, so let's throw it to the back of the line and continue and pop off another one. And if this other one has a different angle, right? Well, first of all, we want to say self dot previous angle equals asteroid dot angle because we just saw that. So we want to keep track of it. And then we want to just return, right? The asteroid because we found what we wanted. And so now this is self.q.popfront, and this is self.q.poppushback. And this has to be previous angle. No, uh, wait, go back. This has to be just straight up previous angle. And this is gonna have to be sum. And this is gonna have to be sum. And now we're returning an asteroid. There we go. So that's our the sort of implementation of iterator all complete, and hopefully it makes sense to folks. So now all we have to do is sort these by first their angle and then their distance. Um, all right, so we have a point. How do we create an asteroid? So impl from point for asteroid. Function from P point to self. All right, so we obviously know what the point is. The angle is, um, 
Well, the asteroid has to, the angle has to be relative to the laser, so it's got to know what the laser is. So in order to create an asteroid, it's going to have to know, it's going to have to know what the laser, where the laser is. Um, and so here we're going to need function, or impl, asteroid, function new, it's got to know the laser, which is a point, and it's got to know the uh, other point, which is a point, and now you can probably make yourself. All right, so uh, we know what the point is, it's other. The angle is, well, let's get the relative x and y coordinates of, just like we did before, of the of this point relative to the laser. So we did that easily before. It's let x comma y equal uh, other dot x minus other dot y comma, oh, sorry, laser dot x. And this is other dot y minus laser dot y. So that's the relative x and y coordinates. So the angle is um, is y as f64 dot a tan 2, um, x as f64, right? And the distance between them um, is, well, we, we actually don't really care about, we only care about relative distance. So let's do distance squared because it'll save us, uh, it'll save us having to take the square root. Um, so let's say let distance squared equal, well, that's just x times x plus y times y, right? Um, and this is always positive. So let's say as u64. Um, and now we can return self, which is the point is other, and the angle is the angle, and the distance squared is the distance squared. All right. So we can make an asteroid. Um, where do we need to do that? Uh, this needs to know... Let's make this actually, let's make the constructor of this take a vector of asteroids, right? Which means we need to turn this into a vector of asteroids. So asteroid new needs to know the laser and it needs to know the other point, which is just point. And so good. So now this is a vector of asteroids. And I guess we don't need this because this can just be that. So now we're passing a vector of asteroids to our constructor function of the iterator. Um, and this is the only part we have left to do, I think, which is correct. So now we need to be able to sort we need to be able to sort this vector of asteroids, which means that asteroids need to know if they're bigger or smaller than other asteroids. So let's implement partial eek, no, partial ord on asteroid. And we'll give it like a custom way to sort itself. By the way, this is gonna be a problem a little bit, which I will explain shortly, but not now. So in order to sort itself, in order to be sortable, asteroids need to know how to sort themselves. So you do that with partial ord and ord in Rust. So partial ord requires this method. So there we go. Um, and to implement that, we're going to need use standard compare ordering, I think. 
uh, because when you implement partial ord, you got to return sort of an ordering as an enum that is either less or uh, ordering greater or equal. Um, so what we have to return is is self less than, greater than, or equal to other. Um, that's what this function needs to return, and then asteroids will know how to compare themselves to other asteroids. Four. All right. So um, we can say that first of all we need to compare the angles. So self dot angle dot compare uh, dot partial compare because ord is not implemented on float so we need to use partial compare other dot angle and let's match on this and if we get some ordering uh, less that's fine we know we need to return some ordering less if we get some ordering greater then we need to return some ordering greater if we get some ordering equal then we need to do some things to do uh, if we get none, then we return none. Let's try and get rid of these errors. Let's see what he's yelling at us about. We might need to um, implement eek or partial eek. So it's saying that no implementation of. Oh, so you need, apparently, partial ord requires partial eek. Um, so I think we can just derive partial eek because it doesn't need to be special. And while we're at it, this should be copy and clone and debug. All right, so now we only have one problem, which is down here. So if we're looking at two asteroids, right, and they have the same, if they if 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 their angles are different, that's fine. Uh, we just sort them in that order. But if they happen to have the same angle, then we need to sort them by the distance they are away, right? So now we just match on. Or just we we can just return self dot distance squared dot uh, and this is a u sixty four so compare we can use compare here other dot distance squared and so that'll give us an ordering right and so we just wrap it in a sum and that's what we want. Uh, good. So that should enable us to sort asteroids. And then I think we might be almost done, except for this angle problem, which I will point out later. Um, okay. So that means we have we have a vector of asteroids here. So it's going to be mutable, and we just need to vec dot sort uh, unstable. Let's say, um, which will sort this vector in place. And the difference between sort and sort unstable is sort unstable like m might does not give you a determined order for things that are equal to each other, um, but we don't really care about that. If two things are equal, we don't care if like the order we get them back in is the first one or the second one or the second one or the first one. It doesn't really matter. So we can use sort unstable here because it's faster. Um, but apparently, sort unstable needs ord to be implemented, and we can implement 
board on Asteroid very easily. So ORD is very similar to partial ORD, except for it takes a compare method, which doesn't return an option. It has to return an ordering. Um, and so all we need to do here is we say self dot partial ORD, no, partial compare with other. And this can return an option, but we can unwrap here. And the reason why we can unwrap here, and I should actually put this here, this is unreachable, right? Because we know that ATAN2, the function that creates uh, these angles, will always give us an angle between, what was it, negative pi and positive pi? Uh, where's ATAN? Yeah, between negative, the, the range of this function is between negative pi and pi, right? And so we know we're not going to get a NAN here. Um, and we've also sort of been careful never to compare the laser to itself. And so in our code, at least, um, this should always be a number that is actually comparable, even though float 64s are not sort of comparable, don't implement or themselves. We know that ours do. Um, and so we're going to have to implement eek as well, apparently. Why don't we just use, to make this easier, why don't we just use our type f64 here that already implements all these things. Uh, which means that this is going to be messed up because this is now an option of F64. Um, so if we turn, if we turn, so I don't think we need, we still need partial ORD, right? We probably still need ORD the way it is, but I don't think we need this anymore. Because I think we can just derive partial eek and eek. So we've got a special way of sorting things, which we implemented by hand. But otherwise, this asteroid can uh, do equality all by itself. We don't need to worry about it. Um, so where do we where do we have problems now? Okay, on line twenty nine. Uh, no function or associated item new found for asteroid. So why can we not create a new asteroid anymore? Oh, because I just deleted the constructor function. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> or shoot, sorry. Uh, so impl asteroid. If you give me a laser, which is a point, and a point, which is a point, then I can tell you where my asteroid is. Um, so, oh gosh, I deleted all this stuff. Sorry guys. Uh, X comma Y equals um, point dot X minus laser dot X uh, point dot Y minus laser dot Y let angle equals uh, y as f64 dot atan2 uh, x as f64 let distance squared equals um, x times x plus y times y as u64 and self, uh, this is um, F64 try from all this business. Uh, yep, question mark, which means this can fail now. So result, error. Um, and we just return self of Okay, point, angle, 
distance squared. All right, so you're still going to yell at us up here because we can now error. Um, so when we create a new asteroid, that is going to be a result. And so we can collect this into a result of vector of error, like that. Missing an angle bracket. There we go. And we can propagate. And so this needs to be, this needs to now return a result error, which means well, we're not calling part two yet. But part two is going to give us let asteroids equal. Um, part two of laser and points and question mark and so now we have we have an asteroids and this needs to be okay all right so now really the only thing left to do is we sorted this vector here and now all we need to do is um, say well we return self and the queue is a vec deck from this vec which is now sorted and the previous angle is none Correct, and P goes before Q. Um, okay, so we're sort of done, except for again, this to do is going to become a problem. But let me explain it for a second. Let's take our asteroids iterator and actually look at what it gives us. So um, while let some asteroid equals asteroids dot next print line asteroid. So we can take a look at what we got back here. Uh, mute. Cargo run day 10 with data 10. Alright, so we got a, a bunch of points that are supposed to be sorted correctly. So let's, let's sort of look at them. So the first point it says is two, f well, here's our laser, right? Um, and, oh, I changed, this is not good, I changed this. Um, so let's copy 10, uh, copy data 10 to data.foo.txt and let's open up foo.txt so we can change it. Oh, which means I actually have to go, all right, what was it? 14, 17, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So here's our laser. And let's run this again. Now that we, our original data is not corrupted. So the first thing it says is go to x0, 16, which is here. But that's not what we want, right? Because I don't even know why it's giving us 0 to 16. What's the next one? 216? Then it hits that one, it says. Then 316. Then it hits that one. And so something is definitely off, right? Well, what's off is the following. Um,
So down here, when we create a new asteroid, um, we get the relative x and y coordinates, and then we get the angle, right? But this angle is the angle from the positive x-axis. But that's not what we want, right? What we want is the, we want to start with the angle in the negative y direction. So I drew a thing that sort of explains this. So that's what this is all about, right? So from a tan 2, right, we're going to get back an angle relative to this axis. But what we want is an angle relative to this axis. And if you sort of think about, oh, this is going to be hard to explain. So let's open up our data again. Uh, CD lib AOC neom dot data foo. So here's our data. And here is this thing I've drawn up here. So if we start by looking up from L, this is in the negative y direction. So we want to start looking down, right? But then we go clockwise as the way we see this data here. And so really what we're doing is we're moving in the positive x direction. Um, we're moving in the positive x direction. So we start out here and then we rotate this way. So we're actually rotating counterclockwise in the sort of regular xy Cartesian coordinate plane. And so if, say for example, Arctan gives us back, uh, it says that the angle is negative pi over two, right? So it would do that for this point, or for this point here. I'm not explaining myself correctly. So let's look at this. So if if we are at, if we're looking up, which is really looking down, um, a tan 2 is going to give us Let's try and figure out what was the fourth quadrant. So the fourth quadrant we said was um, x is positive, but the ratio itself is negative. So we're down here. So if the ratio blows up to y divided by x, if the ratio blows up to infinity, right, we're going to end up getting negative pi over 2 this asymptotes to negative pi over 2. So negative pi over 2 is what what we if we're looking straight up here which is really straight down arctan 2 is going to give us negative pi over 2. So if we have negative pi over 2 from arctan what we really want that to be is say that's our, that's our zeroth angle. That's where we start. Now if we from negative pi over 2, if we rotate this way and we get up to 0, right, so if arctan 2 gives us back 0, we want that to be a quarter turn around from R0. Um, and so this little chart, I think, I hope explains the way we can, we can take what we get back from Arct arctan in terms of the angle, arctan 2, and we can turn it into like an angle that starts at 0 when we're looking down and then rotates around this way, which is what we want. Because in this diagram, that starts looking up and then rotates around this way. So hopefully that made sense. So all we need to do is figure out a way to translate um, this angle into the angle we really want. And the way to do that is to, well, if you sort of look what's going on here, um, if you take 0 and just add pi over 2, you get the right answer. If you take pi over 2, uh, and you add pi over 2, you get the right answer. If you take pi and you add pi over 2, you get the right answer. And so what we want to do is we want to just take the angle that 
R10 gives us back an add pi over 2. So standard f64 consts. This is pi over 2 in the standard library. Um, so that is the angle we want, but the only problem is we want it to start at 0. So, and this arctan can give us anything from negative pi to pi. So if we just shift this whole thing up by 2 pi, we're guaranteed to get something between 0 and 2 pi, which is what we want. And that's essentially what we, or no, sorry. Um, This is between negative pi and pi. If we end up having a negative number, we want to make it positive. And the way you can do that is you can always add 2 pi, and it's the same angle in radians. And so I hope, that this, I hope you guys are understanding this, but if you match on this, we basically want to take, this is what we want, except for we want f if f is less than 0, right? then we really want to return f plus um, 2 times standard f64 consts um, pi. Otherwise, we have a positive number, and we are fine with that. And so we just have f. And so this is our new angle. So what is it yelling at us now for? Oh, so we have an F64 here. So actually, let's do this later. So we get an angle as an F64. We do all this business. And down here, we can say F, F64 try from angle, question mark. And now, what is wrong? Oh, all we got to do is say this is not zero, this is a floating point zero. And so now, hopefully, when we run this and sort, it sorts in the right order. Let's see. We don't need this anymore. And we don't need this anymore. But we can look at these. Uh, so we have 1416 is the first one, and then 151, and then 15. I don't think this is right. Let's actually run it and see what we get. We I mean, might have to debug this a little bit. So really, the answer then is going to be let answer to equal asteroids dot um, nth, the one in the 199th place, um, dot OK, or else um, error could not find 200th asteroid. And this gets us back an entire asteroid, but all we want is the point, the point where it is. Um, oh, and it asks for, it says, take the points x coordinate and multiply by 100 and add its y coordinate. So what answer two really is, it's answer two equals asteroid this is now an asteroid. Dot point dot x times hundred plus asteroid dot point dot y. Um, there we go. And now this should be answer two.
Uh, and we're not printing any more good. Let's try and see what this gives us. I don't think it's going to give us the right answer. No, no, it does. It does. Okay, so 608, which is the right answer. So this is the right way. Um, this is the right way to calculate the angle in the direction and space that we want, such that we are. Uh, so that's we're sorting things in the right way. Um, which I, I I'm sorry I explained really badly, but hopefully you guys can look at the code and sort of understand at some later date why if we transform the angle that arctan2 gives us back into sort of a different coordinate space, essentially, um, it, it, we're essentially doing a tr we're doing a transformation on the polar coordinate space in order to make sure that looking straight down is an angle of zero and then you rotate counterclockwise and the angle gets bigger and it stays between zero and two pi um, and I explained it really really badly but this sort of gives us the answer and is what we want um, I mean we should test we should test this function um, so let's actually make this a function and sort of test it and so I can make sure that it's right so let's say function um, uh, coordinate polar coordinate transformation right and you give it an angle which is an f64 and it gives you a new angle in this new space um, so we just return this right and up here we will use it and then we'll write test for it. So I'll say let angle equals polar coordinates transformation with angle. And we'll write a test. So um me why did I name you so long? But that's okay. Let's come down here to the tests, and we'll say um, test angle, maybe. And this is going to be a test, and it doesn't take anything. And at some point, we'll have test cases, so we'll say input expected in test cases uh, polar coordinates transformation of input um, let actual equals assert eek actual and expected And our test cases will be this. Let test cases equal. So if we start out at uh, zero, then we want to get out Let's test it with actual points. So if we're looking straight up, uh, which means we're looking in the direction 0, negative 1, then we want to output 0. If we are looking, we're going to rotate counterclockwise. So now we're going to be in the third quadrant. So if, we, if we're at negative 1, negative 1, then we want that to be a turn of pi over 2. So f uh, use standard f64 consts star. So we want, no, a turn of pi over 4, which the constant for that is frac pi 4. So we want to be one turn away in terms of pi over 4s. If we get to, no, in the positive x direction. 
if we get to the x-axis, um, which is one comma zero, then we want to be two turns away in terms of pi over four. Um, and all of these need to be tuples. Um, if we swing around and we're at a 45 degree line, we want to be three turns away. If we get all the way up to the positive y-axis, we want to be four turns away. If we get to this line, five turns away. If we get to this line, six turns away. And if we get all the way in the third quadrant, we want to be seven turns away. So I think this sort of says, in, in the space in which we're operating, if you have these x, y coordinates, this is the angle uh, that I want you, I want to output. And hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So we need to calculate first the, um, we're given the xy coordinates, so we need to know, so this is x comma y, and so this is y as f64 dot a tan two of x as f64. That is our let angle equals, that's the original angle. And we pump that into our function. And I guess these need to be I-64s. Hopefully that works. So cargo test, test, angle. Oh, and it does, good. So um, if you're confused as to the transformation I was making to the output of Arctan2, um, take a look at this and sort of see why like these are the angles, this is the new space we want to be living in given these sort of x, y coordinates for the problem. Um, okay, uh, so we can stop ignoring this test and run all of our tests and we should pass. And with that, I think we're done. I, uh, this is definitely the, like probably the least successful video I've had in terms of explaining what I am doing. Um, so sorry about that. Um, hopefully you guys learned something from it at least. I think this is a decent way to solve the problem. Y you could, um, I mentioned I would tell you that you could avoid using the trigonometric function altogether. Um, and that's because this sort of, this sort of direction struct, right? Like you could build it out yourself because you don't really need, look at ATAN2. Um, So ATAN2 is kind of, it's monotonically increasing uh, for anybody who cares about that um, in such a way that like, you don't need to actually calculate ATAN2. All you really need is the ratio um, and you sort of need to keep track of like which coordinate you're in and you can create your own type that sort of uniquely identifies what direction you're looking in for this first part up here. So for the first part, right, we, we needed to create a, um, where's part one? How did that get in there? Um, all right, so for part one, we need to create this hash map that says for every point, uh, give me a unique set of all the directions that you can see another point in. And to create this direction type, we used ATAN2. But we don't need to because we can uniquely identify the direction by just 
keeping the ratio of the x and y coordinates and keeping track of like what quadrant they're in. Um, and so this does not, this does not, like the creation of all the directions does not have to use that trigonometric function. But that is sort of an optimization that, you know, doesn't really matter. And I, I might do it later. Um, and I did it in the original code, um, but I'm sort of running, um, I'm running on, I've taken a lot of time and I'm already sort of proven today that I'm bad at explaining this stuff. Um, and sort of not having a good day of explaining. So I'll just leave the I'll just leave the code at this and kind of rearrange it a little bit. So let's have our functions at the top and our types at the bottom. So let's bring back let's bring this up and put it down here. And let's go find the other functions. Just so when I come back and read this code, I don't know where to find things. So part one. Let's bring that up. So part one, let's stick it here. And parse input to uh, parse input, oops, parse input. Let's take that and bring it back up. So we have parse input, we have part one, we have part two, we have our polar coordinates transformation helper function. Uh, then we have asteroids, which we should know what an asteroid is before we know what an asteroid is. So let's move this up here. So we know what an asteroid is, and then we know what asteroids are, and then we have our direction, and that's all fine. Um, and we are testing, we're actually testing a function today. This is the first time we're, we're doing a real test. And then we test this and we're good. So let's run everything one more time. Oh, let's remove data.foo.txt. Run it again. Cargo run 10 data 10. And that works. And so let's do git status, git add all, git commit m uh, day 10, git push. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's make sure it showed up. Which it looks like it did. So you guys go, day 10, all done and dusted. And with that, I'm going to sign off and I'll see you next time. Bye.